Now, I know you guys are probably pretty annoyed uh, by me now because it seems like all I've been talking about for the past month is revival. But man, I'm excited. I am excited because I believe that God is going to do something amazing. I believe that God is going to change lives in a way that only He can. I believe that we're going to see marriages strengthen. I believe that we're going to see uh, addictions overcome. I believe that we're going to see commitments, recommitments to the Lord and to His church. I believe there are going to be some of you here today that are going to find a new purpose in your life. I believe that fractured relationships are going to be mended. I believe that forgiveness is going to take place. I believe that repentance is going to take place. And I believe that God is going to change Southwest in a mighty, mighty way. I believe we are going to, uh, to be set on a path of growth, but I believe it's a growth that happens internally. It's the type of growth that happens in our minds, it happens in our souls, it happens in our hearts, and then it extends outward into our homes and into our uh, businesses, uh, uh, places where we work, into our communities. Uh, I'm excited uh, to have my mentor, Dean, uh, to come here and to preach. I know that we're going to hear uh, some, some good Bible preaching uh, next weekend. I'm excited uh, for the cookout, right? <laughs> I'm really excited about the birthday cake, too, all right? Uh, I'm excited to be in a tent. I've never been in a tent revival, so that's pretty exciting, too. But listen, revival isn't about a party. It's about life change. That is why we are doing revival. And as you've heard here this morning, we want lives to be changed. Amen? I believe deep down in my soul, I believe that what we are going to see at revival is going to be simply amazing. Because God's the one that's going to be doing it. I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready for God to, to renew us, to revive us. And he's done it countless times in the past. When we look at the Old Testament, we see under Samuel's leadership how revival happened. We see that he revived his people in the times of King Asa and Jehoshaphat and King Hezekiah and Josiah. We see in the New Testament the revival that was brought about by John the Baptist. The revival that was brought about by Jesus' ministry and his disciples. The day of Pentecost, probably the greatest revival that's ever happened in the history of mankind because it spawned the Church of Christ. Philip's ministry to the Samaritans, Paul's ministry journeys, Peter's ministry to the, to the folks there in Caesarea. God is in the revival business, and he revives his people. He breathes life into broken hearts. He breathes life into those that are weary. He brings about restoration to his people. And today, as we close out our Summer in the Sun sermon series, say that five times fast, <laughs> I want us to look at perhaps the greatest responsibility that we have as, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 is where we are going to be today. And there is a sermon outline in the bulletin, if you would like to follow along. We're going to begin in Mark chapter 12, and verse 28. Now, a little bit of context here is going to help us a lot. At the close of chapter 11, Jesus is approached by the chief priests, the scribes, the elders. This is who we would consider to be the leaders in the Jewish faith. And they begin to question Jesus about his authority. What are you doing? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Why are you healing folks? Why are you teaching folks? Why are you performing all these miracles? It seems foolish for them to ask, but they wanted to know, by whose authority are you doing these things? A little later in chapter 12, the Pharisees, again, the religious leaders of the Jewish faith, they come to him, and they ask him about all things. They ask him about taxes. And it sounds strange, but we have to understand, we have to realize that these religious leaders, they were trying to trap Jesus. They, they felt threatened by him, and they wanted him gone. And so, in my opinion, they're grabbing at straws here. They're, they're, they're asking him about paying taxes, trying to find anything that they could possibly stick to him to get him and get him gone. 
The Sadducees, a little later on, the Sadducees, another group of leaders within the Jewish faith, they approached Jesus about the resurrection. Now, the Sadducees, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in heaven and hell. They believed that the soul simply died with the body. And so these Sadducees, they're arguing with Jesus about his teaching on the resurrection of the dead. And that's where we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Mark 12, 28. The writer says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Mark points out that the intent of this scribe was sincere. He saw that Jesus had answered them rightly, and he wants to know more. And I think his question is legitimate. We have to think back to what we studied earlier in, in this year when we looked at the book of Galatians. We might remember that there were 613 commandments in the Jewish faith. So his question, which one's the greatest, is a great question. You know, if we, if we put ourselves in, in, back in his shoes, Jesus is there. He's the Son of God. He's teaching people. And so we might ask a very similar question. Then let's look at verse 29. Jesus answered, The most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus here repeats a, a passage from the Old Testament known as the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. We see that in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And this was a command that was given by God through Moses, and it became a prayer of the Israelites. They would recite this command daily as a declaration of who God is. He is the Lord our God, and He is one. Which is really important because the pagans, they, they were polytheistic, meaning that they believed in many gods. And so God, in this command, the Jews, in their praying this, were declaring that God is one. And that's powerful. And so in this declaration, this daily de declaration, they proclaimed the very nature of who God is, but they also had this daily declaration of how they are to love God. They're to love God with everything that they have. And Jesus, God's own son, says the greatest responsibility that we have is to love God with everything. Love him above all and with all. Jesus gave a second responsibility for us as Christians. It's not the greatest, but it's a close second. He says we have a responsibility to love our neighbors as ourselves. And if we really think about it, it's kind of an extension of the command to love God with all that we have, because if we have a true and a sincere love for God, we're naturally going to love our neighbor. And moreover, if we think about this, if we don't love God, then how can we know how to love ourselves? And if we don't know how to love ourselves, then how are we supposed to love others? I think it's neat, because in this passage... God shows us what true love is all about. Genuine love is all interconnected. It's our love for God and God's love for us. It's our love for ourselves and our love for our neighbor. And so when we think about it, true love all intertwined 
is the answer. Listen to the reply from the scribe that had this commandment question for Jesus. In verse 32, the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other beside him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, we don't have the name of this man, which we've seen several times within the Gospel of Mark where these people are nameless. But we have the conclusion that this, this scribe came at, arrived at, and it shows that his heart was in the right place. This man, think about this, lived under the law. He, he knew the 613 commandments. And he knew what it meant to perform those day in and day out. But he declared here that love is far greater than the law. Now, God wanted the Israelites to follow these commands that he had given them. But what he wanted more than that was the love of his children. To be loved more than anything. And likewise, if you don't love your neighbor, your neighbor who was created by God, who is loved by God, just as much as you are loved yourself, if you can't do those things, then your heart's just not right. God would rather have your love, he would rather have your heart than sacrifices, than burnt offerings. Jesus says in verse 31, there is no other commandment greater than these. And so, folks, what's the takeaway? What's, what's the doggy bag for, uh, for us here today? If we think about it, sometimes people make Christianity a lot more complicated than it needs to be. Right? They either try to make it something that it really isn't by adding these additional principles, these additional practices, these additional rules, or they try to make it something by removing the things that they don't really like. But what did Jesus say? He said the most important thing is to love God and love people. Period. So the doggy bag, the take home for us here today, is that the greatest and the second greatest commandment is an infinite loop. It's an infinite loop. When you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, you are going to love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because you can't love God and hate your neighbor. And we think back to Jesus when he's, he's retelling the Ten Commandments there in the Gospels. And, and he says, you've heard it said, do not commit murder. But if you have hatred in your heart, you're just as guilty. We look at what the Apostle John says in 1 John 4.20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. And let's really let this sink in, church. If you truly and you sincerely love, love God with everything that you got, heart, mind, strength, soul, you're going to love your neighbor and not just love them, but love them like you love yourself. Now, some of us might be saying, I don't love myself. But you do. Because loving yourself means you're going to seek after those things that you need. Those things that you need physically, those things that you need spiritually, those things that you need mentally. You're going to seek after these things. And folks, can we imagine how different this world would look? If we loved God so much that we loved others 
like we love ourselves. That we met the needs of others. Could you imagine what that would look like? It would look like an infinite loop. Love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor. Now, I know we might be sitting there saying, you know, this is, this is totally unrealistic. The world is too big, and the world is too evil, and there's absolutely no way that we could change anything. I'm going to tell you right now, that's exactly what our enemy wants us to believe. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The devil wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. And don't be mistaken, he does not care about you. He hates you, but he hates God even more. And if he can get to you, he, know, he knows that that's going to hurt him. When one of his children gets led astray, separated from him, he comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus came to give life. And life abundantly. And he did that by coming to earth. He did that to, by showing mankind what it truly means to love God and to love people. We think back to what we studied last Sunday. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He gave his life as a ransom, a payment for many. And if we just followed that example, the example of the man whose name that we claim as Christians, if Christians served others like we want to be served, if Christians served like Jesus, if Christians gave of themselves for others and for the lost, just like Jesus did, so that folks would know the love of God. It's an infinite loop. Love God. Love people. Love God. Love people. And I'm telling you, church, I believe without a, without a doubt in my mind that that is what heaven is going to look like. Where we serve God. We love God. We serve people. We love people for all eternity. And listen, I, can, I, I believe that we can experience that same loop here on earth. So long as, and this is, this is the important, uh, important part of this, so long as we realize we're not storing up treasures here. We're not storing things up. We're wroth and, uh, wroth? moth and rust <laughs> will destroy. So long as we keep in mind that our treasure's in heaven. Peter said this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your 
souls. Chuck, hallelujah. <laughs> Friends, this is where the rubber meets the road. We have an opportunity to, to love God, to love our neighbor next weekend. Now, I know there are some that just can't be here, and I get that. But to those of us who can, do we love God so much that we'll be here? Do we love God so much that we will bring someone here? Now, this is not meant to be a guilt trip. It's not. It's meant to be a self-inventory. It's meant to check ourselves. Do I love God so much to come here and to have an open heart and to have open eyes and open minds? Do I desire to be revived? Do I desire to recommit myself to the Lord? Do I desire to recommit myself to the Lord's church? Do I desire to know God's will for my life? Do I desire to be here next weekend to see God move in my life? to see God move in the life of this church? And do I love God so much to bring someone with me? Do I love them so much that, that I, I want to love them like I have been loved? Listen, every single one of us who's here today is here because of someone else. Maybe it was a parent or a grandparent who shared Jesus with you Maybe it was a neighbor or a coach or a co-worker. Maybe it was a best friend. Maybe it was the person who became your spouse. Maybe it's a goofy-looking guy on a video trailer down at the movie theater. <laughs> but you are here because someone else told you that there is a better way to this life. You are here because someone told you about Jesus Christ. Do you love your neighbor so much to say, hey, Imagine this conversation. Hey, there's a better way. There really truly is a better way. There is someone who loves you more than you will ever know. And guess what? I know that person. He's Jesus. And I can help to introduce you to him. You know, we're doing this thing at our church Saturday, Sunday. I'd like for you to come. And despite what the world may tell you, Christians don't bite. <laughs> okay? They're actually no different than anybody else. They struggle too, and they've been known to fail. And they certainly don't get it all right, but what they have that this world doesn't have is Jesus. And that Jesus makes everything right. He gives us forgiveness. He gives us purpose. He gives us a future. He gives us love. And listen, I want you to know him because I love you. So church, do you love God so much that you'll make it a priority to be here? Do you love your neighbor enough to ask them to come to be a part of this? Friends, I'm telling you right now, revival's beginning next week, next weekend, and it's going to happen in our own lives, and it's going to happen in the life of this church. And so will you be a part of that?